You caught me. <gasps> I was leaf peeping. No, I'm just kidding. But I am looking at the yellow birch tree. And now that you're terrain experts, I thought we would create kind of a probability map um, based on some different parameters. For instance, where is it most likely that a yellow birch tree grows so that we could go there and look at its beautiful yellow leaves or see if it has any uh, tasty sap or chaga or whatever it is that you want. Paper birch is also interesting, but it's a little more picky about, oops, sorry. Yellow birch is more picky about where it grows and paper birch is kind of more ubiquitous. So we'll look for yellow birch. When I decided to look for um, information about this, I just Google searched um, the Latin name and added the word habitat and kind of came up with a lot of uh, USDA Forest Service pages. And this is the first one I looked at, yellow birch. And when you kind of go to the bottom, you can tell, oh yeah, okay, work cited. It looks like they've done their homework, right? It's pretty important that when we are going to do subjective types of work, when we're going to decide where is something more likely and where is it not more likely, it's good if it's backed up so that the information we're using, we can kind of cite. So what do I mean by wanting to make something ordinal and, and where is something more likely, where is it not more likely? Well, we know how to make kind of elevation models now and um, use those elevation models to study the landscape. So the first thing I might Google is just elevation. And apparently, aha, in the Green Mountains of Vermont, birch grows on a particular soil type. I'm not a soil scientist, so I can't really worry about that. Um, but for our purposes, it looks like the upper soil horizon is influenced by elevation and aspect. That's great. Um, and they've been used to estimate a site index. It looks like birch grows better at lower elevations than higher elevations. And it also grows um, on northeast aspects rather than southwest aspects. So we can use this one line of information to at least partially inform our map making process. What else are we interested in? Um, I'm pretty interested in what other type of kind of forest cover it is a part of. And it looks like it's present in all stages of forest succession. That's good because that means it does, we don't care if it's a young or old forest. It looks like it's pretty, pretty present throughout all of them. And it says it's a major component of three forest cover types. Hemlock yellow, sugar maple beech yellow, red spruce yellow birch. Again, I'm not a forester, so my analysis is going to be flawed, but I'm going to take this to mean it's very common in mixed forests as well as uh, hardwoods. And I also went to another site and found that it's kind of, it's very much a part of the transition zone between lower elevation deciduous forests and kind of higher elevation spruce fir forests. So we know that it is a tree that appears to like to be in a mixed forest or in amongst other species. So mixed and hardwood forests are probably where it's more likely to be and conifer forests, maybe it's less likely, um, but it's still possible. We also know it's more likely to be at lower elevations, at least in the green mountains of Vermont. And it looks like it doesn't really grow above 792 meters. So that's kind of a nice reference point there. Um, and it's also more likely on certain aspects. So let's take that and download some information and we can start working with these parameters and make an ordinal um, kind of classified set of rasters that we can combine together. What I'm going to do first is type in VCGI and that's Vermont Center for Geographic Information. If you didn't Google that, you could also just type Vermont GIS data and up pops VCGI as the, as the top hit. So I'm going to type in that and say Vermont Center for Geographic Information. Okay, that's what I want. I'm going to go to their data and imagery page. And I'm just going to type in elevation and see what pops up. And we have all these options, but I want a DEM. And I don't expect you to know exactly how to pick these out yet, but I'll tell you that at the scale that we're going to do this, at the, you know, the state level, I want something that's a little coarser than 10 meters. How about a 30 meter DEM? This one looks pretty good. 
and it's the USGS National Elevation Data Set, which is kind of a, a pretty good standard elevation data set that is across the whole country, and it's been well managed and everything. So let's just use the 30 meter DEM. Um, it might be a little older, but I think that's okay. So let's download that. And while that's downloading, I'm going to go back and search again for uh, what is the only other thing we need. Well, let's get a land cover data set because we can get our aspect and um, you know all of our other derived terrain products from our DEM. So land cover comes up with LCLU. Hmm, what does that mean? Well, that's the land cover land use data set. Um, that is a nice data set and I would probably want to use the most recent one, the 2011 data set. But I think I want to actually use the NLCD, which is the National Land Cover Data Set. This is just a very good data set. It's kind of been around for a while. Um, it's a little old. It's almost 15 years old. But it's easy to use, and I think we're going to use this one. So use the land, um, the National Land Cover Data Set from 2001 USGS and download that too. And once you download those, let's drag them onto the desktop. And uh, we talked a little bit about kind of folder hierarchy, but I'm going to make I'm going to make a new folder, kind of a project folder here and call this tutorial 2. And drag these into my tutorial 2 folder. And even in my tutorial 2 folder, I'm going to make a new folder called um, underscore source. And you might have better or worse luck than I do with the initial underscore. Sometimes that can mess up programs. I've never really had a problem with it, but um, it will make it so that every, it always sorts to the top, you know, whenever you sort by name. So I think that's kind of nice. Source. And now I'm going to extract this data in here. Extract here. And there's my DEM24 and my land cover. And now I can delete my zip files. So I'm going to delete those. Cool. Well, it looks like I've got some good, uh, good information. And I'm probably going to want a scratch folder. So I'll make a scratch folder as well. And this is for files that I might generate that I don't really care about that much. So that's pretty good for now. Scratch and source. Very good. So the next thing we're going to do is go and open up QGIS. Okay, go ahead and open up your Tutorial 2 folder. In my source folder, I have my elevation model and my land cover. I'm going to bring in the elevation model first. And if you open that folder, you'll see an info file, a text file, which is I'm pretty sure just the, um, it's the metadata, and then the DEM underscore 24. And I open up that folder and I see this hdr.adf, which might scare you, but it's okay. It's really just a different format of the raster data model. So I bring that in. And voila, there's Vermont in all of its glory. Um, I might be tempted to just go up to my raster terrain analysis tools and try to run them. But what do we need to remember about running terrain tools? And I'm hoping you can tell me that we need to make sure the horizontal units, meaning how big are the pixels and what are they being measured by, are the same as the vertical units, the Z units. So. I'm skeptical because I know that in general coordinate systems tend to be in meters um, horizontally, but I don't think Vermont has any mountains that are 2,500 meters, which would mean they're close to six or 7,000 feet. So in order to be certain though, I want to check both sets of units. So I'm going to go into uh, my properties here for my HDR, my, my digital elevation model. And if I go to general, I can see, aha, we've got um, a coordinate system here that if I, if I go look at the coordinate system, it says units equal M. And if you can remember, that means meters. And we're in a, a UTM zone right now. So that's great. So we know that horizontal units are meters. The pixels are measured in meters. How do I tell what the vertical units are? Well, there is the way that I was just mentioning where if, you're, if you know something about the Green Mountain Range, you can just look it up online and say, okay, well, 
the highest mountain in Vermont is 4,000 feet. So maybe I should look at the max and the min and see what's going on there. So I, I might click max min here under the style just to see um, and hit load. And it looks like, yep, we're in the 4,000 range. So these aren't meters, they're probably feet. But to be completely certain, I could also go to my um, my metadata, which is the smart thing to do. So I'm going to go look at the metadata. And if I open the metadata, I can, I'm going to content search it just like I always do. Control F and I'm going to type in unit and say, what are we looking at here? Aha. And it says, um, Vermont state plain meters. Okay. So we're in a, a different coordinate system, but that's okay. So horizontal unit is in meters, Vermont state plain, and the vertical units are in feet. So we, there are two things we could do. We could either figure out how to use the kind of Z factor part of our terrain tools. Um, what do we type in there? It's a conversion. Um, but I kind of want to just change this whole raster so that the values actually are stored differently. Right now the values are stored as feet, but if you can imagine, if we could just multiply this whole raster by a constant value, we could change the unit from meter, sorry, from feet to meters for the Z unit. So I'm going to call up my friend Google and say, how many feet are in a meter? And Google says there are 3.28084 feet in one meter. So I can open up my raster calculator and say, okay, let's take this, which is in feet, divide it by this number. And if I divide my feet by that, I'll end up with one meter for every foot, um, every 3.28084 feet. So I'm going to do that and I'm going to save this. We're also converting it to a GeoTIFF, which is useful because we like that format of the raster data model. So I'm going to go back into my tutorial video and my, I'm going to call this source data still. And I'll call this DEM underscore um, meter, uh, Z units are meters like that. So DEM underscore Z underscore meters. Save. Okay. And voila, with any luck, it won't really look any different. It should look almost identical. Um, except that the values that are being represented here will have changed slightly um, because our units are now in meters instead of feet, at least numerically. So this digital elevation model is going to be useful. Now we can go ahead and let's run all of our terrain commands. Okay. Uh, there we go. We've got our terrain information and let's move on to the next video.